So I'm here with uh, Brett Fitzgerald from the Game Fish and Spook Foundation. And we're, today we're going to do a little presentation, uh, we're going to have a little experiment, per se, on metals and see what the salt water does. So this is taken out of my shrimp tank here in the shop. So it's pure salt water. Uh, and every week we're going to show you, we're going to display these metals and see what they've done underwater in a weekly process, uh, week by week, and then until we, uh, until we come up with a, a scenario. So this right here, we have lead. We're going to use a, a lead sinker. We're going to put it in the salt water just like that. You can see the water's clear now, so it's curious to see how the water changes in time. This one's stainless steel. We use a stainless steel hook on that one. We have a galvanized hook on this one. And of course we have uh, aluminum uh, ring on this one here. And real briefly, I, I want to get your opinion on what do you think is going to happen here. Well, so this is salt water, right? This is salt water. So we know that salt water is much more corrosive than fresh. Uh, and all of these are touted to be pretty sturdy. So I think that we'll do this for a month. It might even take longer. We can do it on, on, a, on a weekly basis. We'll see where we go from it. If we get to the point where, hey, listen, this is, you know, this is, uh, we get, I think we've got done enough experiments on it, but, but we're going to leave the same water in there, the same metal in there, and each week we'll pull out the metals to see what it actually did to the metal, and we'll actually see the color differential in the water and see what it does uh, to the water. Gotcha. Well, my prediction is that the galvanized is the one that's going to show the most wear the soonest. And uh, I don't think we'll see anything in the water. Maybe some stuff on the bottom across the board. Do you think it's still going to be clear next week? So, what do you think? Uh, we'll, we'll find out. I don't. I don't know for sure, but we'll definitely. It'll be interesting to see what happens here. So stay tuned next week and see what our results on a weekly basis on this test that we're doing. So, Mike, this weekend. Uh, we had horrible weather to go fishing, so I mean, we didn't get really good reports. And the only people that did go out were only the people that went out of uh, Palm Beach Inlet. Uh, the waves were so bad in Boca, Boynton, Hillsboro, all down up and down the coast, where you couldn't almost, you almost could never be could not get out. Even Jupiter was bad. And Palm Beach seemed to be the only inlet where you can go out there and go catch, uh, go yeah. fishing. Yeah, let's explain why that is, because some people may not understand. What happens is Palm Beach Inlet is very deep. And so the, the big waves don't have a chance to actually become breaking waves or, or you know, they're just rollers, you know. What happens is in, in Boynton, in Ju well, let's start, Jupiter, Boynton, Boca, Hillsborough, they're much shallower uh, inlets. So what happens is when the, when the rollers get into the shallower water, they build and they become like breaking type waves, which is extremely dangerous. And you need to, you need, need a huge boat or you need to be, timing it perfectly which is almost impossible over the weekend over the past um, weekend yeah. prior to the weekend though fishing was extremely slow is the full moon mm -hmm. uh the full moon made it very difficult for for fishing uh uh you know for fishing pelagics and stuff you know the, the 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 key is for the full moon the fish eat all night and get full and stuff but what happens also is um the, the bottom fishing was actually very very good well, I think, uh, I think the reason why it was good because we had that swell and it started shirting up the bottom a little bit. The fish were a little bit uh, more reluctant to bite whatever they can get on. Instead of feed as a predator, they were probably more, more of a, of a uh, opportunist, per se, to feed on everything they could find. Because when that water gets stirred up, they can't be the predator. They've got to be an opportunist. That's right. my opinion. No, and, and also with the full moon and the extreme tides we had, because we did have some pretty extreme tides, you know, when that water's flushing out, uh, on, on the outgoing tide, all those all those fish are you know sitting there feeding you know, and same thing on the incoming tide with the inshore you know, so it it, it, it makes you know it, it, it creates it creates a feeding frenzy as well. But um, so th that said, uh, you know, finally some people are able to start going out again, um, and uh, and you know the fishing is is starting to pick up a little bit. There there's been some sailfish being caught. Uh, there's been a few cobia here and there. Um, you know some pompano here and there but but the dolphin is the hot fish yeah because uh it is getting that time of year we have two months of this uh dolphin season that we'd like to call you know uh, march april and a little bit in the and may is not bad either and once the, it peaks probably around the end of april beginning of may and then it starts to uh to you know simmer down for say but dolphin is the hot fish a lot of people did go out off palm beach and they tore up the dolphin mm -hmm. catching what they wanted uh, almost limited out anybody who went out there so there was a lot of dolphin being caught again not a lot of people were out there 
uh, only the people who have had the cojones for say <laughs> go out there. Uh, but nevertheless, dolphin was a hot fish. Yeah. Uh, and go ahead. Well, I was going to say so. So you know, this is the this is different times of the year for different you know kinds of fish, and 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 you know, dolphin will probably be good all summer long. I hope, but. Uh, this time of the year, the spring, you know, when we're getting into spring, like the April, you know, give or take, you know, a couple here and there, you get the bigger size dolphin that are going to start coming through. They they have not gotten here yet, but there's going to be a week or two where everybody's getting really nice sized dolphin. Uh, usually around a- April every year we get that. And remember, anybody can catch dolphin, even Mike here. Yep. He's caught in dolphin before I've seen it. So it's proof that anybody can catch dolphins. Hey, listen, Andy caught his first dolphin la- of the year last year uh, on my boat almost at the end of the year. <laughs> but, but no, just we like to bust each other's balls about that. But, um, yeah, dolphin, they grow fast. They eat a lot because they do. They grow up to 20 pounds in one year, so they eat everything they see. So generally they are usually easier to catch. But, you know, you You've been there where there's been a school of dolphin under the boat. They won't eat anything. Right, too, right. You know, that, that's, that's tough. Even the best anglers can't usually sometimes you get, get You actually want to get something really small and ready on the line. And, and you almost got to, it got to be fairly small because, again, they're probably most likely they're full. And you jig that little tiny jig or shrimp or whatever you yep. got, and you got to work it hard. You got to entice those fish to come and eat it. It's very difficult, and there's no guarantee. Let, let's, and if let's, there's no male around, mm-hmm. if the bull's not around, it's a proven fact that the fish will actually, uh, they, you're almost inevitably not going to catch one. Right. Let's go ahead and, and maybe show a little thing that we can use when they aren't eating like that. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. when, when, when there's a school of fish that you just can't get to eat anything, uh, you know, we'll show you little tricks that we use sometimes to try and get them to start eating. Okay, let's show that really yep. right now, Mike. All right. Welcome to the Snook and Game Fish Foundation Conservation Report. Um, this week we have Captain Brett with us. Uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, the swordfish um, uh, permits that uh, they're trying to get for longlining. That's right. I thought we would. So in, this is, there's a little bit of history behind this that's recent, and then I thought maybe we could talk just a little bit about longlining in general and why it causes people so much fear. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about this particular permit, this uh, exempted fishing permit, what that actually means. And, uh, and then maybe some alternative ideas that we could accomplish the goals that they said they were getting without allowing long lining in our waters, which I think would make everybody happy. So I think very first, I, I was researching this and I learned some things about the history of Atlantic swordfish that was interesting to me. The, the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic sword fishery, and the ones that we have right here, we have, a, we have a nursery right off of Florida. And that's the area that we're really concerned about. It's closed off to fishing. Long lining, you know, they started long lining for swordfish commercially. It's only been since the 60s. Right. It hasn't been that long. And the average swordfish that was sold commercially at that point was about 250 pounds. When it got to its worst in uh, the late 90s and they said, we've got to do something about it, the average swordfish sold was 90 pounds. That's, that's important to kind of put in context for a couple of reasons. One, if you go back another 100 years, when they first started kind of keeping track of these things, in the 1860s, it was very informal. It was articles written. The average swordfish landed was four to five hundred pounds. Wow! So we've come down quite a bit, oh, yeah. right? But even if you went from that two hundred and fifty level to where they were when it was at its worst, and it's, it is coming back up, it's, it, it has gotten a lot better. Uh, an average female swordfish can live to be over two thousand pounds, twenty-two hundred pounds. Males are a lot smaller. Uh, about two hundred and twenty pounds is as big as they get. And machel, males mature pretty quickly three right. years, when they're at about 72 pounds. Females don't mature for about five years until they're 150 pounds. Right. So if you think about that, the females, if they're not matured until they're 150 pounds, and the longliners are taking them out when they're an average of 90 pounds, we got a problem. That's right. we got a problem. So there were some changes made, and one of them was there's no more sword fishing, longline sword fishing off of Florida in this area that we found out was a nursery uh, where they were coming in, having the babies and, and baby swordfish come out, guess what, they eat too. So getting into long lining and why it's a problem. If you don't know much about long lining, long lining, the important thing to know is it is exactly what it sounds like. A boat runs out a line that's miles long and can have hundreds of hooks on it. Um, the, the technology has changed. It has improved somewhat. The circle hooks that they use, it's been great for, for uh, sea turtle survivability. Uh, however, it's had the opposite effect on uh, some sharks and sailfish and other stuff that get stuck on there and it's right. just 
it's, it's, not, it's not helping that. It's actually made it worse for some of the tunas. Uh, Longliners particularly target swordfish and tunas because that's right. where they get the most, most bang for the buck. The heaviest buff. fish and most yep. desirable. But one of the things that's different about long lining and the kind of fishing that you do when you go for swordfish, conventional with hook, hook, and, uh, hook and line, is that your fishing weeds out the smaller fish. It, the harvest that you get, the fish that you catch, well, you'll get some small ones under size or whatever, right. but the fish that you catch generally are on the larger size. And, and that type of conventional fishing tends to, have to skew the catch in that direction. Whereas long lining, it's indiscriminate, it catches all size of fish. That's and right. so there's a, there's a size limit, the smaller ones that are pups, they let them go. And unfortunately, by the time they get them to the boat, when they've been hanging on the hooks, That's right. they're already dead or dying and aren't going to survive. Uh, long lining, as you know, or as you might guess, with baits hanging out there for miles, it's also indiscriminate in the species that it catches. Right. So of particular concern for this particular area, and I know some people might think we're getting overrun with sailfish, there's going to be an immense number of sailfish bycatch here. Also, uh, white marlin and blue marlin. There's a, predict uh, a predicted number of bycatch on those, which right. none of us want to see. Um, I think that's really, you know, some of the some of the most egregious points that I wanted to make about long lining and how it applies to swordfish. Right here. Now, also one thing I did want to mention is when you're talking about when when recreate when it's being recreational fished and and and. When we do catch the smaller swordfish, their survivability rate is very high because we catch them right away and we let them go right away. Whereas, as you said, when you're long line, it's soaking for hours, uh, you know, multiple hours. And, you know, you don't know when that fish was caught and, and how long it's staying on the line. And, you know, a lot of times by the time they get these smaller fish, they're dead or close to dead or they're shark bait at that time. That's right. So. The estimated bycatch or discards of undersized swordfish from long line, and I want to say this was uh, two years ago, it was 438 metric tons. Wow. Metric tons is uh, 2,200 pounds. Yep. So if you're talking about average size big fish that are coming in that are 90 plus pounds or even 150 pounds if we're getting back up to that, that's one thing. But we're talking about the babies. So I'm giving you a weight in metric tons. How many more of those small fish it takes to achieve that number? Right. It's a staggering number of yep. swordfish that are being lost from long lining. So to have those long linings out here in the nursery grounds, it's a, it's a double whammy on that population. So right. coming back around to this whole thing and the whole way that this is being done, the, it's closed, and it's been closed for quite a while. They're not planning on opening it, but there's a loophole sometimes that, that people can use to get into a fishery that's been clo closed for the purposes of research. And that's called an exempt, exempted fishing permit, or EFP. And that's what this is here. Now, EFPs can be used for, for very good reasons, and typically they are. So this is another point of contention for me, that when you see something like this that just appears to be so egregious and so obvious that it's a fish and a money grab, it's troublesome because now the next person that applies for a legitimate EFP, they're going to have to deal with the public opinion that, oh, they're just doing this because they want to kill fish. Right. Whereas EFPs do actually provide researchers with a lot of valuable information. In this particular case, the history of this particular EFP is this exact same plan was proposed a year ago and the South Atlantic Council approved it. And at that time, the principal party in this was Nova University. And there was a commercial fishing group that was attached to it. And this is what made it pretty obvious to many people that this is, this is a money grab, a fish grab. But the deal is that NOVA would collect the fish and use the data, and then the commercial fishing company would be able to take those fish and sell them and make their money, along with, you know, if there's bycatch exceptions for the other fish that they catch in there. So there was such a large amount of public pressure to not allow this to happen that NOVA backed out. They were already awarded the permit. They just decided, okay, we're not going to use it. We're just not going to use it. So what happened? This year, this council meeting, there's a discussion this week in Jekyll Island, Georgia. Nova's out of the picture. They brought in a different group as a principal party. Exact same permit. Exact same commercial group is involved with it. Exact same research goals. But now it has to be revoted on because once you change the principal party, the last one becomes... Um, invalid. So there's a chance for us to, to be able to get up there and, and make a change this time and, and not allow them to uh, approve it. Um, 
The one thing that I want to wrap up on with this, and then we can come back with any other points you want, is the research goal. What was stated, I, I was digging up, looking up information on this, and I found an article by EDF, the Environmental Defense Fund, who typically people think of as being an anti-fishing group. That article actually applauded the EFP and said it was a good thing to happen. And the reason they said was it was going to get a lot of valuable research. But the research they were talking about was collecting electron, electronic reporting data on the longline fishery, the size of the fish and the catch rates and that sort of thing. And when I read that, I almost lost my mind. Because for the past almost 10 years, SGF has been working on electronic reporting programs, the iAngler program. And I realized this is information that we can provide to them, ourselves, recreational anglers, without increasing the harvest, without changing any rules, without targeting the smaller fish. As long as we report our catches, the ones we keep and the ones we let go in iAngler, this is not only a good personal logbook, but it's another tool for us to help keep longliners from using this type of research as an excuse to come in and put their long lines in our fishing waters. That's, that's really <laughs> right. all I can say about that. It's, just, it's an easy way for everybody to get involved. Log your fish. There isn't a fish that's reported that's not important. Some people say, oh, I'm not going to report fish because I don't go fishing or I don't catch as many fish as Danny Barrow or whatever. Every single time you go fishing, every fish you report, it has value. And this is exactly why. There's so many ways we can use that data to help protect our fisheries, protect our rights as anglers. We're doing this stuff on our own. We don't need long liners to come in to provide that information. We can provide it without damaging the fishery and without asking for anything in return. Right. No, I agree. Um, there's not much I want to add to it other than, you know, that there, there are going to be some people out there that are watching this that, you know, they're mad at, at the parties involved and, you know, we're going to stay professional, leave some, some you know, names out, but, you know, just provide the information but it, it is very important that um, that we do stay on top of this and uh, and and you know somewhat don't let it happen because the, the, again it, it is a nursery it's a breeding ground uh, uh, it, there was a reason why it was closed and there was enough research done at that time when it was closed uh, the fact that Nova you know that's the only name we're mentioning but the fact that they backed out of the situation should show uh, you know, a huge, uh, you know, sh sh it's an eye opener. Right. It, it, uh, the, the fact that the, the university that was, you know, named a part of this the first time around, the fact that they backed out of it and don't want to be a part of it shows that something is there um, that, and, and, and there is a party that is involved that is going to benefit financially from this whole deal. Right. It's interesting that every organization that fights to conserve Billfish that has a stake in the game, IGFA, the Billfish Foundation, they've come out publicly and opposed this. Uh, in fact, the industry, ASA, you think, well, they might want to do it because they can sell a long line tackle, you know, and that, that sort of thing. They came out and opposed it, and they're actually going to be up there providing public comment. I would say when we kind of see how this thing unfolds later this week and see how the vote goes, it might be the end of the story. But if it's not, we might be following up with a, with an actionable item. We might be asking you, um, hey, call this person or write a letter or email this person and give your opinion on this. Let people know what you think about this EFP. You know, think about what we talked about today. Make your opinion and then make your voice heard to the people that can do something about it. All right. Well, thanks. And uh, if you have any questions, comments, uh, whether you agree, disagree, if you want to get in touch with us, you can reach us at xgen at gmail.com xgen at gmail.com I'm sorry xgenfishing at gmail.com xgenfishing at gmail.com can we, can we get it put on here Wayne? Alright great Alright guys thank you Welcome to the Next Generation Fishing Report Rig of the Week This week Dolphin is the hot fish as you heard before, we are trying to show you uh, some, you know, s some specialized rigs for uh, getting these dolphin to eat when they're when they're being real picky. Um, all right. So if you are trolling, uh, we we do suggest you you go ahead and, and and scale down your tackle a little bit. What we have here is a little squid type jig, um, you know, on a uh, fluorocarbon leader. Okay, and this is just something something to get them to start eating. Okay, uh, it's tiny. You're more, more or less, 
getting their attention with this and it's like a little snack for them uh we do recommend trolling these um you know anywhere from way back all the way into your prop wash i've caught some uh, nice dolphin on these okay uh next thing is i like to have a spinner rigged with uh something very tiny again something this is more of a reaction bite uh, okay they'll they'll start chasing it and they may hit it just as a as a re reaction because it's driving them nuts uh, little flashers uh, on the on the jig never hurt, uh, you know. And again, something similar it doesn't have to be exact. They, they they have you know all kind of colors, flashers, tiny stuff. You, I do recommend scaling your tackle back way back to light tackle, and I also recommend uh, using fluorocarbon leaders with this. I like to put this on a uh, spinning rod so you can cast out to to the dolphin and and, and you know bring it right through the school. And sometimes you will get one to eat. Another thing is too, if you're specifically going for dolphin, if, if it's hot and it's the time of the year where they're not biting so much, live shrimp will sometimes get get the fish get going. Um, you know that never hurts. Also, some chum. If you put some chum out and some uh, you know some some glass minnows to toss out here and there, there that also helps too. Those are all you know nothing. It's very hard to get them to eat. Nothing it, uh, is a sure thing. But those are all methods we have used successfully in the past to get the school to start eating again. And again, this is your X Generation Fishing Report, Rig of the Week. Weather and predictions for this weekend. Uh, Mike, what do we have for the weather? Uh, the beginning of the weekend, it's going to be uh, southeast winds around 10 knots, 2 to 4 feet. In the Gulf Stream, they're saying about 5 feet. And then Sunday, it's going to switch around to southwest winds, 15 to 20, and it's going to be 4 to 6 feet. Is it going to be ground swells or is it going to be rough? I mean, like choppy. Uh, I'm, I'm so because it's going to be southwest. Uh, it, I, I believe it is going to be more of a swell on the southwest. So going out again, going out of Boynton, um, Jupiter, Boca, Hillsboro. You want to be careful with those with those swells. You know, if you can sit there, watch them, see if if, if the waves are breaking. You know, and and you, it's got to be timed right and all that. S Saturday's definitely the best day out of all of them. Well, that's good. It's fine. We get a good day. That's right. At least at least on a weekend day. You know. Um, so, Andy, what are your predictions for this weekend? Predictions. Uh, I'm going to go after that dolphin. If I was to go out there, which I, I won't be able to, but unfortunately. But if I was to target a species, uh, dolphin would be my species to be targeting. Uh, also, keep in mind the bottom fishing is going to be really good with, uh, with the way the, uh, the, the bottom is all stirred up. Uh, I think the bottom fishing is going to be another topic to talk about next week. That's right. What do you think? I have a tournament this weekend, so I'm going to be targeting kingfish. Um, you know, kingfish has been a little bit tar tough to target, although they, they have been caught, uh, you know, they're year-round. But um, I, I'm with Andy. If I was not fishing this tournament, I would be doing a little bit of bottom fishing. That's what I would be doing. Um, you know, bottom fishing is fun. You know, and you catch, you catch a blue runner or something you could put out as a live bait, usually a blue runner. Uh, you know, you put that out and you catch something else, you know, a wahoo, a kingfish, whatever. So, And, and keep in mind that, that I know after a swell like this, the pompano fishing gets really good, although they're mm -hmm. hard to find. But when you do find them, the fishing, pompano fishing gets really good and permanent fishing as well. So keep that in mind if you're a beach fisherman. Look for, the, look for targeting those species. Uh, as far as snook. Uh, they've been catching the snook, and we haven't had that cold, you know, it's getting warmer, so the snook are starting to show up, or not, not to say show up, but they, they're being a little bit more aggressive when it comes to feeding, so yeah. uh, keep that in mind, snook fishing would be a good target species if you're doing the inside uh, job there, and, and as far as I'm concerned, bottom fishing and dolphin fishing. There you um, go. So anyway, we're going to name, this, we're gonna have, we have a segment called Name the Species of the Week, it's a $25 gift certificate to X Generation. You must email us, and you must be the first person with the correct answer to email us this, uh, at xgeneration at gmail.com. Xgeneration. X, X -gen gen fishing. fishing. I'm sorry. Xgenfishing <laughs> at gmail.com. I don't know why, this, I don't know why we're getting it wrong. This, but anyway, xgenfishing at gmail.com. And here's a species right here, guys. If you can name this species right here, okay, you'll get that 25. And you must be the first one to email us. And you have to watch the next show to see if you are the winner. And, and if you do email us this species correctly, of shark, you will get that uh, that uh, uh, $25 gift certificate to next generation. Yeah, you you we'll, must be very specific with what type it is. So that's yeah, what, yeah, it's got to be. Yeah. And, you, and you have to check your email to see if you are the winner. We're not, uh, uh, I'm sorry, when you email us, 
you have to watch the show next week to find out if you are the winner because we will not be emailing you back. You do, you know, there's a little caveat there. You do have to watch the show to find out if you are the winner. Okay. And again, if it doesn't, uh, nobody answers it correctly, we roll it over and uh, the stakes get higher. So keep that in mind. That's right. Um, we like to thank our sponsors. We'd like to thank our sponsors, X Generation, WRPBI TV, JCAM Lures, Silver Lining Charters with Captain Danny Barrow, uh, and uh, Exit Realty uh, with uh, Devin. Contact Devin for all your real estate needs. Uh, so uh, we'd like to thank you for watching our show, and see you next week, and support your local tackle stores. Keeps you healthy at Cigna.com slash go you. <laughs> what was that for? Because you're my grandpa. Dollywood. Love every moment. Creatures big and small, we discover connections that stay with us forever. Discover a place where worlds connect. Sea World. Entertaining the Grand Canal Shops at the Venetian. Honey, look! Dolphins! Oh, I can't believe it! Talk all you want. Just $24.99 a month. Sweet bondage! fun and excite your kids about wildlife at the Palm Beach Zoo. Get close to hundreds of animals like endangered tigers, playful otters, even a Florida panther. The Palm Beach Zoo, it's your zoo. Presenting Riverstone with the best of everything in an ideal Naples location. 11 gorgeous decorated models with a fabulous clubhouse and an incredible resort lifestyle included. You deserve the best. Luxury residences at Riverstone. From the 400s to the 700s. Immokalee East to Logan Boulevard. Visit glhomes.com now. I believe that there are still mysteries in the world. And wonders and surprises. I believe that fun is a renewable resource. That's some things you'll never be able to download. I 
believe that when we celebrate life in creatures big and small, we discover connections that stay with us forever. Discover a place where worlds connect. SeaWorld.